Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at William Sausage, the home of authentic country goodness and family-owned and operated since 1958, right here in Tennessee. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum in Heritage Park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Tina Jarman, who is with the Promethean Foundation in Union City, Tennessee. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week, just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City, we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the incredible heritage of our beautiful home here in West Tennessee. Today's guest, Tina Jarman, is going to tell us all about the Promethean Foundation, among other things. We're going to talk about beauty pageants. We're going to talk about who Prometheus was and why her foundation is called that. We're going to talk about the importance of what she and her foundation are doing and all kinds of other fun things. Welcome, Tina. How are you today? Pretty good. Pretty good. So tell me a little bit about the Promethean Foundation. Well, what we are is a foundation where we give scholarships to at-risk children to go to daycare. And the only stipulation is you have to live in Obine County to get it. That was one of Robert Kirkland's thing. He wanted he wanted to see every child in Obine County be able to go to preschool. So this is a foundation that was originally started by uh, Robert Kirkland, who yes. also uh, founded Discovery Park of America. Correct. Um, why was this, what you do, important to him? At the time, he felt like children that did not go to daycare were behind those that did when they started kindergarten. And when we say at-risk children, we we look at poverty level of the family, how many people stay in the household, um, education, incarceration, drug abuse, debt. Did they finish high school? Things like that. So it's not a lot of people think we we just help those that are single parents. It's a it's a scoring system. So we look at a variety of things of what we consider at risk. And what we found out was. It's a cycle. If you were raised by a single parent, you're typically going to raise your child as a single parent. If you were raised in poverty, you typically are going to be in poverty yourself. And so we wanted to, he wanted to, Robert, um, help any way he could to alleviate some of those stresses that come along with raising a family, which, as we see, parents who work or go to school tend to break a cycle. And so what better way to do that than to fund child care? And it is very expensive to send your child to um, daycare. And those that need it the most, which is in those categories I named earlier, um, are the ones that typically cannot afford to send their child to daycare. So that cycle just keeps going. I mean, it's incredibly important work, and we're going to dive in a little bit more in a minute. First of all, let's back up to little Tina <laughs> from, I'm guessing, Obion County. Where did Tina come from? <laughs> Obion County, I am from Union City. Oh, born and raised. Born and raised. I went to school at Austin P. wound up coming back home and graduating from uh, UTM. I started working at a daycare. You, <laughs> Ironically, when I had uh, my daughter at 21, I could not afford daycare. And I was at UTM and when and worked at McDonald's and I was like finding whomever to watch her and I was like I've got to get something consistent and, well, and what pressure yes you're trying to figure out you're wanting to raise your your child up right you don't mm-hmm. want to just leave, leave her with leave anyone her anywhere mm-hmm. and so you're working at McDonald's you're mm-hmm. trying to go to school mm-hmm. surely the pay you made at McDonald's took everything to get yes. food on the table yes it, um I found a lady who watched her in her home that I knew, loved her. Um, But it was one of those things, if something happens with her family or her child or 
with her, I had no child care. And then so, you're either calling in sick, mm-hmm. you're missing a class. Ironically, I took her to class a couple of times with me. And the lady I work with now, Dr. Marty Herndon, who works part time at the Promethean Foundation, was my professor. Several, I had her for several classes. And um, she remembers Nadia when she was like one. And um, it's ironic we work together now. It's amazing. Yeah. So I started, I uh, found a daycare. And um, at the time, back in 99, 2000, daycare was $80 a week for my child. I, I couldn't even afford that. So the assistant director there said, well, you know, if you work here, we'll work with your school schedule. Your child care can be $20 a week. So that is what I got me into child care. And that $20, and you'd be surprised working at McDonald's, going to school. Um, I was still working at McDonald's and working at the daycare, actually, and I finally gave up one and just started working at the the daycare. Um, but twenty dollars was still a lot every week. Um, you know, minimum wage then was I guess four seventy five, something like that. And um, you know, you, I didn't live in government housing, so I had rent. You know, I'm by myself, and um, twenty dollars was still a lot. Oh yeah, you of know? course. Mm-hmm. Looking back, you think $20, and that's why I relate so much to the parents we have come through our foundation. Oh, you've lived it. I lived it. I know their struggle. I know when it's, you have $20, $30 left and you got to get gas in your car, you're going to have to eat something while you're working for lunch, and you still got to buy groceries for home or, you know, different bills. Your, your kid needs a little jacket or a project that you don't want them to be left out. That's a lot. All right, one trip to Walmart. One trip to Walmart, and you can wipe it your out. Your money's gone. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so you made. What was your major um, at UTM? I finally uh, received my master's in family and consumer science. Congratulations! Yeah. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what do you attribute uh, you being able to do that? One thing that's different than I've noticed than others that do struggle is I have a strong family support. That support system is what gets you through because there are going to be days you're you're totally stressed out. You know, when you get off work, you still have homework, you know, you still have housework. Those things don't stop um, whether you have a kid or not. Um, So with the help and that, that probably had a lot to do with why I never left Union City. Um, I had uh, my parents, um, helped me out. I didn't have to take my child to Walmart. Right. Uh, you know, right. I, that was my getaway. I could go to Walmart by myself. Or Walgreens. Or Walgreens, <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't have to, if I needed her to be watched while I did study or something, I had my parents. Yeah. So that support system that kept pushing me was there. Everybody doesn't have that family support system. Um. So you obviously started working um, what happened between where did you work anywhere before you ended up at the foundation or I have worked at the daycare until I graduated, actually, till I graduated college with my bachelor's. And then when I graduated, it's funny because <laughs> I got this accounting job at this factory. Do I look like I do numbers? <laughs> it was so boring. Yeah. Um, the office was all beige and I worked with all men <laughs> Who had yeah. no clue of my life or a child, didn't care. Older me and my dad's age me. <laughs> and one day my boss comes in, he was a real nice guy. He comes in and he said, What have you done? I had color coded and put up some colorful posters. <laughs> I was like, I can't work like this. This is just not me. I need some color. I brought in a radio. Needless to say, I didn't stay I stayed there about eight months. It wasn't me. Um, and then um I got a job at the high school and um, was an assistant there and just went from there to um, then I got a teaching job down in Tiptonville. And what subject did you teach? The, down in Tiptonville was at Head Start. Okay. So that was still pre-K. Yeah. And um, I really liked that, but that was around the time gas got up to about 450. It got really high. And that's 30 minutes down the road. And it really wasn't feasible to do that. Yeah. And um, and then I worked at Tyson And um, no, I went back to the high school, I think. And then I went to Tyson and I was like, I can't work here. It's second shift. And it was during the summer. And I was like, I've got to get me a job teach. You know, I got to get back in the classroom and uh, a daycare called. There was an ad in the paper and um, I stayed there until I went to Perinthia. 
And so what, what, what got you there? Was it an ad or how'd you get The there? Promethean, I started there. Um, my job at the daycare, I was director at that point. It ended, it was stressful. Um, and I started observing for Promethean. A lady there knew me. They they knew me because of daycare. I worked in the daycare. Right. And um, they asked me what I like to contract with them and start observing other teachers and whatnot. And it went from there. And the lady got sick and wound up having to leave. And I just popped in her position and I've been there ever since. It's meant to be. It was. I mean, I tell I tell parents all the time, everything happens for a reason. Um Sometimes you think you're at your lowest point where well, you're there for a reason. And you look back and you say, that's why that happened, to prepare me for this. That's right. You that's know, exactly and right. it's sort of a positive outlook because sometimes you can get so down, like, why, you know. And God tests your faith just to see if you're trusting him. And sometimes you're like, I, I just don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know how much more I can take. And right. then you look back. I look back at things and I'm like, uh huh. That's why you did that. Had I not went through all this, I wouldn't be ready for this. And he knew he he put me through all that just because he was gonna have me in Promethean to work with other parents that were going through some relatable things that I had been through, so I could relate with them and talk right. with oh, them. I, I can't imagine how helpful you must be to somebody who stumbles in that place frustrated and tired and not knowing where to turn where next. Where to turn? Yes, and. You'd be amazed at a lot of people, they're young, that come in, and um, a lot of them don't know me when I was younger. They just know what they see now. And I, I'll say, well, I worked at McDonald's. I worked at Tyson, and they'll look at me, and they'll say, you? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I didn't always have this cushy job you see me at. I started somewhere. Yeah. You know, I always had a job, but it wasn't. You can't start at the top and stay at the top. You work your way there. Right. Um. But once they hear that, they're like, oh. And I was like, yeah, no yeah. matter where you're at. Your, it your hope. For yeah, them. Your I, I hope guess. For you know, I'm just like, you know, I wasn't always here. So did you know Robert Kirkland? Yes. I. He's on our board. He was on our board for a couple of years before he had to leave. And um, most laid back man, I, I would not have thought he was Robert Kirkland had you not told me. He didn't dress like it. And he always wore... Shorts with socks up to his knees. Like. <laughs> and I'm just like, you just don't look like you're did, Robert Kirkland. Did you give him any fashion advice? or? No. <laughs> let me tell you. We have board meeting once a month. At the time, it was all men. Mm-hmm. And they sit at the table, conference tables. Mm-hmm. And you sit there and you go over whatever you're talking about for the month. And it is very intimidating. <laughs> and none of these men are intimidating men. Yeah. They just appear that way as you're sitting across from them going over finances or whatever. Sure. And I'm just, I was just like, a couple of them are educators. So I've had them in school or one of them used to be a superintendent. I had him. And I'm thinking, I wonder if he remembers that I did whatever. <laughs> you know, like, I don't even want to look at you because I know you remember me standing on the toilet calls and all that. Play, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the problem with being in a small town. That's the draw. That's right. That, they, uh, they, yes. Yeah. Whatever you did, it is not gone. Yeah, your People history. remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why Prometheus? I mean, why Promethean and who was Prometheus? I did a little research. So Why so don't you tell me? I can tell you who Prometheus was, but... Um, I think our listeners would want to know that the reason it's called that is because Robert Kirkland, I'm assuming, named it himself Mm -hmm. because he was a fan of the story. He liked um, the story so much that there's actually a statue of Prometheus right outside here at Discovery Park of America, right next to um, uh, Thomas Jefferson and Ronald Reagan. Um, And then further down is Abraham Lincoln and Ayn Rand. So, really? Yeah, I've a, been here several times, and I, I don't think Prometheus, I've ever paid, he's the guy paid who's, attention. He's the guy who's in front of the firehouse. He's crouched down, and there are eagles attacking him. I did not know why. I thought this guy huh. did not like um, eagles. Um, <laughs> but here's the story. So apparently, and now this is in Greek mythology, Prometheus was a titan, which is a god that existed before the Olympian gods. He is credited with the creation of man from clay, and he stole fire from Zeus and gave it to humans. 
which enabled progress and civilization. Zeus did not like that, so he changed him into a rock and sent eagles to eat his liver every night, which would then regrow the next day. So that is who that is. Then we had the rock move to Discovery Park of America, so if anybody wants to see Prometheus... They can come here and see him right out there. Wow. In our, yeah. I have just been to the fire station like once, I think. So maybe well, that's why. Maybe I need to walk over on that side. We got to take you over there. Next time you go, um, we'll get a picture of you um, with Prometheus. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, do people, when they call your office, it's not an easy word to say. Come on, let's let's say Prometheus. We shorten it to pro kids. To pro kids? Oh, my gosh. That, is that better? That is so much. Yeah. That's That's... So much easier for you as a communicator to be able to say pro kids. Yes, most people say pro kids. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, And that sounds, you know, uh, like professional kids. Yeah, that's great. But we all know it's Promethean. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're a daughter, you're at McDonald's, you're a young mother. Would you have ever thought, fast forward to today, that you would have such a talented, beautiful, intelligent daughter? who is about to be in the Miss Tennessee Volunteer Pageant. I tell you what, definitely knew she was special, but pageant never crossed my mind. So how'd that happen? She has never done pageants, and her senior year, she decided she was not going to cheer. Okay, I'm glad. No fundraising. But out of nowhere, she said she she wants to be in this local pageant. And I said, huh? Never been in pageant, I said, huh? And she said, yeah. I said, well, okay, I guess we got to go get a dress. So let's do it. And she placed, and she fell in love with it and decided that's what she wanted to do. And we were in every local pageant. Any pageant that was going on, we were in them, and she was placing. And we were spending money on dresses. And Did you go to Joanne's? Yes, Joanne's. She worked there, oh. which was mistake number one. Um, when she started working there, she saw all the dresses coming in. Oh, you, got a, you got a gown store in town. Yeah. Why, why not work there? Well, that's, it, that's right. And it did turn out, you know, she, you get it at call. So it sort of helped my See, pocket. So, there hey. you go. But yeah. Um, and then she was in the big one for teenagers, um, the Miss Iris Tennessee team. And that's in Jackson, same spot. And we were just going to be happy if she was in the top 10. It was a big one and um, scholarship. And she won. And I will never forget that day. I was, I was shaking on the video. And <laughs> I was just like, oh, my God. Because that was still everybody that was on that stage had been queens. You know, it wasn't just your local with a few, you know. It was some stiff competition. And um, everybody was beautiful. But, um she she loves it. And it was that moment that I realized because she got a nice scholarship for it. And I said, you know what? This might be the route to go, you know, helping out with uh, school. Absolutely. So um, Miss Tennessee Volunteer Pageant does the same. You know, she gets a scholarship just for walking on stage. There's all kind of ways of getting scholarship money without even placing. So whether she wins or not, she's walking away with some money to help her with her education. Does she know where she wants to go yet? She is already at school. She's oh. a, she's 19. Um, she goes to Georgia State okay. in um, Atlanta. And uh, so you can see why we need scholarship money. Of course. <laughs> out, of, out of state. <laughs> she couldn't even go to tennis. Couldn't even go she, to she UT. She couldn't even get, get it free. Yeah, couldn't I mean, go to Tennessee. Yeah. Couldn't go to UT. Following your footsteps. Mm-mm. But I made the mistake. Ever since she was in the eighth grade, me and her went to Atlanta uh-uh. for a girl's trip. Uh-huh. She fell in love with the city. She loved the diversity. She loved the all the excitement. There was always something to do. And she really just fell in love with the city. She, could, she knows her way around Atlanta before she even went to school there. And when it came down to it, it was that school in um, MTSU. And um, 
she chose. And I didn't think she was going to like Georgia State because it's not campusy. It's in the middle of downtown. Yeah. You got the math department right next to the police department. You walk a couple of blocks and there's humanities or whatever, you know, the art building. It's not It's not a campus at so all. So she's choosing the urban life. Yes, yeah, she loves the you urban tra- life. You, you know, she may be back. A lot of folks. Yes, go that out is of so town, true. They get their little fill. And mm-hmm. they come back home. That's right. And, and, you know, I told her, I said, you know, a lot of people look at that like failing. It's not. Um, I told her, I said, you know, you can always come back. No no big deal. So I'm, I like to tell people because a lot of people don't like to come back home because they like they couldn't make it. But you know what? It's good that you have a home to come back to. Some people don't. They got to stay where they are and continue. Especially failing. when someday in the very far future, she's got her own little baby that she's going to bring home mm-hmm. to, to need a grandmother. You know, mm. I tell her now, this is not grandma. Uh, I don't know when it is, but now it's not. <laughs> no, that's right in the future. Um, um, I like to tell people Union City is one of those places that is also to raise a family because you know your teachers personally. You know when your kids spend the night with someone, you know their mom or dad and probably the grandmom and granddaddy, you know the story. You know, there was, I remember one time Naughty wanted to stay with someone and I said, isn't that such and such? I don't know, because you knew the household. So <laughs> it's good to raise your family here mm-hmm. and it's good to retire here. But if you are in that mm, 25 to 35 If you're a beauty age, queen. Yeah. You want to you want to be able to go out to eat. Yeah, and... there's not much for you to do, you know. You want to you want a little more. But you can always come to Discovery Park of America, That's right? right. That's right. You have a lot of extras on the weekends. Thank you for coming and talking to us about the Promethean Foundation. You guys are doing um incredible work and so so needed. And I know you're making yes. a difference in a lot of people's lives. Yes, so thank you for that. It's a great foundation. Great foundation. Um a lot of people don't know it's a research mm. uh, program, actually. Mm. It's eventually they'll write a book is what it'll be. Yeah. And it'll be in all the data. We're, we've already contracted with UTM Yeah, about comparing the children that went to daycare. We follow these children all the way till they graduate high school. Oh, wow. Okay. We get their test scores, everything. Yeah. We compare those that went to school, daycare, and those that didn't and just see how they do, um, especially with their character traits. You know, are, are they honest? Mm-hmm. Um, I noticed that uh, integrity and character, and ter- oh, that uh-huh. was a big part of what yes, you all do. Yes, um, we think that a lot of these households, that if they're at least at a stable environment, eight to ten hours a day, that somehow something gets through about being honest, um, being responsible, um, because that carries all over. We're we're hoping that that carries over when they get older, by holding a job, um, stealing from your friends, and things like that. We're hoping that's something that they got earlier. And research tells us that those early years do affect how at the end. Absolutely. At the end. So, If somebody wants more information about Pro Kids or the Promethean Foundation, mm-hmm. where do they go? Well, we, they can go to our website at www.for, the number four, prokids.org. Or they can call us at 731-884-0088. Awesome. Well, thank you for all the hard work. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for having me, and um, welcome aboard, I guess. Thank you. And now let's hear from a guy who knows all about Prometheus and all the others who were recognized with a statue out in Freedom Square here at Discovery Park of America. Here's Andrew Gibson from our education department. And now Tina and I are going to go out and take our picture next to Prometheus himself. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at Discovery Park of America. And today I'm joined by Russell Orr, Discovery Park's very own in-house scientist, who will be sharing with us more and about telescopes. Uh, we have many telescopes on display here at the park located on our third and upper level. Uh, so, Russell, what are we what are we going to share with the world about telescopes today? Well, I thought that we should talk about telescopes since, as you know, Andrew, uh, we often have stargazing events here at Discovery Park. We, you know, have like an astronomer comes by and we go out and, and use our telescopes. But the thing is, Discovery Park has several different kinds of telescopes. And there are, are two major branches that a telescope will, will uh, fall under. You have either your refracting telescopes and you have your reflecting telescopes. 
and and so what's the what's the biggest difference between those? Okay, so a refracting telescope uses a series of lenses in order to uh, magnify what you can see when you look through it. A reflector telescope uses a series of mirrors instead, uh, and one of them, it turns out, is clearly better than the other. And which one is clearly the the better one? Well, you really, 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 if you want to have a telescope, would probably rather have a reflecting telescope if you were a scientist. Uh, There are several reasons for this. One of them is, um, you know, the different colors of light, they have slightly different focal points. They they behave, you know, like, like a family of siblings, you know, the oldest and the youngest don't quite behave alike because they're not the same size, not the same age. Well, uh, violet light and red light are, are quite different. Uh, so they, they, they come to focus at different points. And this can give you uh, unusual problems in your image that's uh, called chromatic aberration, where the different colors uh, focus at different points. And it will make uh, the edges blurry which is really bad. I mean, if you're trying to figure out a planet and you're trying to figure out what the atmosphere is, which will be around the edge, don't you want to know what color it really is? I certainly do. Of course you do. And so do scientists. Um, Another problem with refracting telescopes is holding up the lenses. Now, you and I both wear glasses. Isn't that right, Andrew? It is. And our lenses are are held around uh, the edge, right? You know, they're, they're held around the rim. Well, the glasses that we have, we don't have lenses that weigh a whole lot. But if we had really big lenses, uh, holding them up would be an issue pretty quickly. Uh, they have to be very precisely aligned. You can't let them sag or bend or you'll throw off your amazingly beautiful telescope. Uh, not only that, but you can only support a lens around the circumference, right? Now, how big is the mirror in the bathroom in your house? I don't know the exact. Well, how is it like more than three feet wide? Yes. Of course. Well, mine is like five and a half feet wide because you can put a back support on the mirror. You can support it from the entire back, which means uh, you can make mirrors much, much bigger than you can lenses and not have them sag. Uh, So uh, whenever scientists are using telescopes nowadays, uh, you're going to have reflectors that that dominate the, uh, well, it's not really an industry, but, but dominate the field because they have numerous advantage over refraction teles- refracting telescopes. And now we have both, we have both, but you can make a reflecting telescope really, really big. So we also have electric telescopes. Um, what about, what, what's the deal with those? Uh, the, you mean the ones that we we pivot around with motors when we're looking around? Uh, so that that telescope that we use, it is a reflecting telescope, and uh, it's pre-programmed so that we can uh, find all the different star uh, different stars. Just like if I, you know, we have all these landmarks at Discovery Park. If I said told you that you're somewhere between the doctor's cabin, which is on your right, and the Loom House, which is on your left. There's only one place that you could be. You'd be have to be somewhere along that line. So that's what that telescope does. You you put um, uh, celestial uh, landmarks, if you will, uh, and it figures out where everything else is based on where those objects are. All right. Well, I know a lot of our listeners have discovered something new today. I know I certainly have. Uh, one little fact before we go, like Russell said, we do have stargazing events out here mm-hmm. that is open to the public. So we'd love to see you come out and use some stars with us. Free of charge. We uh, want to thank you all for listening. We want to thank Russell for coming on today. Uh, so once again, this has been Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. And we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.